Welcome to the Emergency Care and Transportation of the Sick and Injured, Chapter 31, Orthopedic Injuries Lecture. After you complete this lesson and the related coursework, you will understand the anatomy and physiology of the muscular skeletal system. You will have learned the proper assessment for the suspected and obvious injury. You will have learned general and specific types of muscular skeletal issues or injuries, including fractures, sprains, dislocations with associated sign symptoms and emergency treatment, including the use of splints, pneumatic anti-shock garments, and traction splints. Okay, as an introduction, the human body is a well-designed system in which form, upright posture, and movement are provided by the muscular skeletal system. The system also protects the vital organs of the body. The bones and muscles are suspect susceptible to external forces that can cause injury though. And also at risk are the tendons, cartilage, and the ligaments. Musculoskeletal injuries are among the most common reasons why patients seek medical attention. And musculoskeletal injuries are often easily identified because of the pain, swelling, and the deformity. Although musculoskeletal system injuries are rarely fatal, they often result in short or long-term disability. And so a do not focus solely on a musculoskeletal injury without first determining that no life-threatening injuries exist. All right, so let's talk about a little bit of the anatomy and physiology of the musculoskeletal system. And so there are three types of muscles. And when we talk about muscles, we talk about skeletal, smooth, and cardiac muscle. And first, we're going to talk about the skeletal muscle. And this, uh, um, the skeletal muscle is also called striated muscle because of its characteristic stripes. It attaches to the bones and usually crosses at least one joint. It's called voluntary muscle because it is under direct voluntary control of the brain, responding to commands to move specific body parts. Skeletal muscle makes up the largest portion of the body's muscle mass. All skeletal muscles are supplied with arteries, veins, and nerves. Blood from the arteries brings oxygen, glucose, and nutrients to the muscles. Waste products, including carbon dioxide and lactic acid, are carried away in the veins. Uh, skeletal muscle tissues uh, is directly attached to the bone by tough rope-like fiber structures known as tendons. And tendons are extension, uh, extensions of the fascia, fascia that covers all skeletal muscle. Next, we're going to talk about smooth muscle. And of course, smooth muscle performs much of the automatic work of the body. And I think of smooth muscle as being in the tubes of the body. Um, it's also called involuntary muscle because it is under, um, it is not under voluntary control of the brain. It's found in the walls of the tubular structures of the body, such as the gastrointestinal tract and blood vessels. It contracts and relaxes to control movement of the contents in these structures. And then of course, we have the cardiac muscle and that it composes of the heart. And it is a, a specially adapted, involuntary, of course, muscle within, and it has its own regulatory system. The skeleton. So let's talk a little bit about the skeleton. The skeleton gives us a recognizable human form. It protects our vital internal organs and allows us to move. It's made up of approximately 206 bones and the bones also produce blood cells uh, within the bone marrow and they serve as a reservoir for important minerals and electrolytes. And so on this slide, uh, you could see the human skeleton. And so the skull, uh, it protects the brain and the thoracic cage protects the heart, lungs, and great vessels. Uh, the lower ribs protects uh, the liver and spleen. The bony spinal canal encases and protects the spinal cord. The pectoral girdle 
um, consists of two scapulae and two clavicles. The scapula, which is a shoulder girdle, is a flat triangular bone held to the rib cage by powerful muscles that buffer it against injury. And so the clavicle, um, which is a collarbone, is a slender S-shaped bone attached by ligaments to the sternum on one side, uh, one end, and to um, a process on the other end. The clavicle acts as a strut to keep the shoulder uh, kind of propped up because it is slender and very exposed, this bone is vulnerable to injury. So the clavicle is very vulnerable to injury. And this uh, figure uh, shows that pectoral girdle. So it shows the anterior view on the side to the um, left and then the posterior view um, on the side to the right. And then the, um, the uh, upper extremity extends from the shoulder to the fingertips as uh, is composed of the upper arm, which is the humerus, uh, the elbow and the forearm, the radius and ulna. The upper extremity joins the shoulder girdle at the uh, gallohumeral joint. The humerus connects with the bones of the forearm to form the hinge elbow joint. The radius and ulna make up the forearm. The radius, the larger of the two forearm bones, lies on the thumb side of the forearm. So think about where you take your radial pulse. The ulna is the narrow and is on the little finger side of the forearm. When one is broken, the other is often broken as well. The hand contains three sets of bones. The wrist bones are the carpals, the hand bones are the metacarpals, and the finger bones are the phalanges. The pelvis supports the body weight and protects the structures within the pelvis, the bladder, the rectum, the female reproductive organs. So the pelvic girdle is actually three separate bones fused together to form the, um, the bone. And so uh, I say the IIP, it's the ischium, ilium, and pubis are the bones that are that form the pelvic girdle. And then uh, we move down into the lower extremity. So it consists of bones of the thigh, leg, and foot. The femur, which is the thigh bone, is the long, powerful bone that connects the uh, into the ball and socket joint of the pelvis and is a hinge joint um, and into the hinge joint of the knee. The femoral head is a ball-shaped part that fits into the um, ancipium connected to the shaft or diasophis by the femoral neck. The femoral neck is a common site for fractures, especially in the older population. The lower leg consists of two bones, the tibia and the fibia. The tibia, which is the shin bone, connects to the patella, which is the kneecap, to form the knee joint and runs down the front of the lower leg. The much smaller fibula runs behind and beside the tibia. Okay, the foot consists of three classes of bones, ankle bones, which are the tarsals, the foot bones are the metatarsals, and the toe bones are the phalanges. The largest of the tarsal bones is the heel bone or the calcanus, um, which is subject to injury with axle loading injuries. And this is uh, such as when a person jumps from a height and lands on uh, the feet. So that's an axle loading injury. The bones of the skeleton provide a framework in which the muscles and tendons are attached. So bone is a living tissue that contains nerves and receives oxygen nutrients from the arterial system. When a bone breaks, a patient technically or uh, typically experiences severe pain and bleeding. A joint is formed wherever two bones come into contact. So joints are held together in a tough fibrous structure known as a capsule, which is supported and strengthened in certain key areas by bands of fibrous tissues called ligaments. Moving joints, the ends of the bones are covered with a thin layer of cartilage known as articular cartilage. Joints are bathed and lubricated in synovial, which is joint fluid.
joints allow circular motion. So, so the shoulder or hinge motion, such as in the knee and elbow, or minimal motion, um, such in the sternal clavicular joints, or no motion, such as the sutures uh, we have in our skull. So muscular skeletal injuries, let's talk about those. So injuries to bones and joints are often associated with injury to the surrounding soft tissues, known as zone of injury. And uh, mechanisms of injuries of, uh, in, include a significant force in generally required to, known to cause fractures and dislocations. These are direct blows, indirect blows, twisting forces, high energy forces. A direct blow fractures the bone at the point of impact. An indirect force may cause a fracture or dislocation at a distant point. A twisting force are a common cause of muscular skeletal injury, especially in an, um, a ligament or a medical uh, ligament uh, in a knee. Um, so high energy injuries produce severe damage to the skeleton surrounding soft tissues and vital internal organs. A patient may have multiple injuries to many body parts and can occur, this can occur in motor vehicle crashes, falls from heights, gunshot wounds, and other extreme forces. A significant mechanism of injury is not always necessarily to, necessary to fracture a bone. A slight force can easily fracture a bone that is weakened by a tumor, infection, or osteoporosis. Okay, so let's talk about fractures. So a fracture is a break in the continuity of a bone, often occurring as a result of an external force. And so I want to repeat this definition because this is the definition, the, the technical definition of a fracture. And a fracture is a break in the continuity of a bone. And this can occur anywhere on the surface of the bone and in many different types of patterns. There is no difference between a broken bone and a fractured bone. A potential complication of fractures is compartment syndrome. And, and this is an elevated pressure within the uh, fiscal compartment. Fractures are classified as either open or closed. Your first priority is to determine whether the underlying skin is damaged. If not, the patient has a closed fracture. With an open fracture, there is an external wound causing either, uh, caused by either the same blow that fractured the bone or by the broken bone ends lacerating the skin. You should treat an injury that breaks the skin as a possible open fracture. Complications of open fracture include increased blood loss and higher likelihood of infection. Fractures are also described as whether the bone is moved from its normal position. So a non-displaced fracture, also known as a hairline fracture, is a simple crack of a bone that may be difficult to distinguish from a sprain or a simple contusion. A radiograph examination is required. A displaced fracture is an actual deformity or distortion of the limb by shortening rotation or agulate, um, agulation. Medical personnel often use special terms to describe particular types of fractures. Okay, so a comminuted is a fracture in which the bone is broken into two or uh, more than two um, fragments. And an, an epithelial is a fracture that occurs in the growth section of a child's bone that may lead to growth abnormalities. A green stick is an incomplete fracture that passes only partially way through the shaft of the bone, and these occur in um, children. We have an incomplete uh, fracture, and that's a fracture that does not run completely through the bone. 
um, an oblique, and that's a fracture in which the bone is broken at an angle across the bone, usually as a result of a sharp angle blow to the bone. Um, and a pathologic, that's a fracture of a weakened or diseased bone generally produced uh, by a minimal force. And it's usually seen in patients with osteoporosis or cancer. And then there's the spiral um, fracture. That's a fracture caused by twisting force, causing an oblique fracture around the bone and through the bone, often the result of abuse of a very young children. Transverse is a fracture that uh, occurs straight across the bone. It's usually the result of a direct blow or a stress fracture caused by prolonged running. Suspect a fracture if one or more of the following signs are present. So if you have a deformity, um, if the limb may appear to be shortened, rotated, or angulated to the point where there is no joint, always use the opposite uninjured limb as a mirror image for comparison. Um, suspect a fracture if there's tenderness. So point tenderness on palpation in the zone of the injury is the most reliable indicator of an underlying fracture and uh, suspected fracture if there's garden, guarding. Uh, an inability to use the extremity is the patient's way of uh, mobilizing um, it to minimize pain. So the muscles around the fracture contract and the attempt to prevent any movement of the broken bone. And uh, is there swelling? So rapid swelling indicates bleeding from that fracture and is typically followed by uh, substantial pain. Uh, is there any bruising? So fractures are almost always associated with ecchymosis of the surrounding soft tissue. Uh, bruising may be present after almost any injury and may take several hours uh, to develop. Crepitus, that's a grating uh, or grinding sensation, uh, which can be felt sometimes even heard um, when fractured bone ends rub together. And is there false motion? So that's a motion at the point in the limb where there is no joint. Are there exposed fragments? Um, and in an open fracture, bone ends may protrude through the skin or may be visible within the wound. Never attempt to push the end of a protruding bone back into place. Is there bone? Is the locked joint? Is there a locked joint? So a joint that is locked into position um, is difficult and painful to move. Okay, so after fractures, now we're going to talk about uh, the next orthopedic injury we're going to talk about is dislocations. So dislocation, the definition is a disruption of the joint in which the bone ends are no longer contact and the supporting ligaments are often torn, usually completely, allowing the bone ends to separate completely from each other. A fracture dislocation is a combination injury at the joint in which the joint is dislocated and there is also a fracture of the end of one or more of the bones. Sometimes a dislocated joint will spontaneously reduce or return to its normal um, position before your assessment. So um, you will be able to confirm the dislocation only by taking a patient history. A dislocation does not spontaneously reduce is a serious problem. If it does not spontaneously reduce, it's a serious problem. Commonly dislocated joints include fingers, shoulder, elbow, and a knee. Signs and symptoms of a dislocated joint are similar to those of a fracture, um, and those include marked deformity, swelling, pain, at, pain that is aggravated by the attempt of movement, tenderness on palpation, virtually complete loss of a normal joint movement and numbness or impaired circulation to the limb or digit. After dislocations, the next orthopedic injury we're going to talk about is the sprains. And sprains occur when a joint is twisted or stretched beyond its normal range of motion. As a result, the supporting capsule and ligaments are stretched or torn. A sprain should be considered a partial dislocation. Sprains can range from mild to severe. The most vulnerable joints are the knees, shoulders, and ankles. After the injury, 
the alignment generally returns to a fairly normal position, sprains do not usually involve deformity, and joint mobility is limited by pain, not joint integrity. The following signs and symptoms often indicate that the patient may have a sprain. The patient is unwilling to use the limb, so they're guarding it. Swelling and echomosis. Pain prevents the patient from moving or using the limb. Instability of the joint. Um, you will frequently not be able to distinguish a non displaced fracture from a sprain. So remember to document the mechanism of injury. Now, the next uh, orthopedic injury we're going to talk about is strain. So it's, it's, you need to get the sprains and the strains clear in your head. So a strained is a pulled muscle, and this is a stretching or tearing of the muscle. It causes pain, swelling, and bruising of the soft tissue in that area. It occurs because of an abnormal contraction or from excessive stretching. Strains may range from a minute separation to complete rupture. And like a sprain, no ligament or joint damage um, typically occurs. Often no deformity is present and only minor swelling is noted at the site of the injury. And some patients may complain of increased pain with passive movement of injured extremity. Most patients will have extreme will have extreme point tenderness. Then the next um, orthopedic injury we're going to talk about is amputations. And so an amputation is an injury in which an extremity is completely severed from the body. This injury can damage every aspect of a musculoskeletal system from bone to ligament to muscle. The complications, so um, complications of orthopedic injuries. So orthopedic injuries can lead to numerous complications, not just those involving the skeletal system, but also uh, systemic changes or illnesses. So it is essential that you do not focus all of your attention on that skeletal injury. The likelihood of the complication is often related to the strength of the force that has caused the injury and the injury's location. And also, don't forget the patient's overall health. And so to prevent um, contamination uh, following an open fracture, you should brush away any obvious degree, debris on the skin surrounding an open fracture before applying any dressing. Do not ever um, probe an open fracture site. Uh, Long-term disability is one of the most devastating consequences of an orthopedic injury. You can help reduce the risk of or duration of that long-term disability by preventing further injury reducing the risk of wound infection, and minimizing pain by the use of cold and um, also pain medicine. So transporting a patient to an appropriate medical facility. Next, we're going to talk about assessing the severity of this orthopedic injury. And so the golden period is critical, not only for life, but also for preserving limb um, viability in an extremity with anything less than complete circulation, prolonged hypoperfusion can cause significant damage. So any suspected open fracture or vascular injury is considered a critical emergency. Remember that most injuries are not critical, but you can use musculoskeletal injury grading system table on 31-1 to identify critical injuries. Okay, so next we're going to talk about the patient assessment. And so with the patient assessment, we want to always look at this big picture. When we're evaluating the overall complexity of the situation, we want to determine and treat, of course, any life threats. Um, we must be able to distinguish mild injuries from severe injuries because some severe injuries may compromise neurovascular function, which could threaten long-term function. Okay, so as always with the patient assessment, the first thing is the scene size up and scene safety. My information from dispatch is going to indicate the MOI, 
the number of patients and any first aid procedures that's been used prior to our arrival. So uh, try to identify the forces associated with this mechanism of injury. As usual, standard precautions may be as simple as gloves, but a mask and a gown may also be necessary. So sim uh, consider any possibility that there may be a hidden bleeding. Evaluate the need for law enforcement as well and advance life support or additional ambulances. Also, within mechanism of injury, look for any indicators. Be alert uh, for both primary and secondary injuries. Primary injuries occur as a result of the mechanism of injury. Secondary injuries are a result of what happens after the initial injury. And consider the injuries of the MOI uh, would lead you to ex consider what injuries the MOI would lead you to expect. Focus on identifying and managing the life threats, of course, and treating the patient according to his or her level of consciousness. Address significant internal and external bleeding and treat for shock. And check the responsiveness using your APU. Ask the patient about his and her chief complaint. Administer high flow to the non rebreather if they need and ask about the mechanism of injury. If there's significant trauma or multiple body systems affected, the muscular skeletal injuries may be a lower priority. So uh, scene time should be, not be wasted or prolonged because of the muscular skeletal assessment or splinting. So of course, airway and breathing. Fractures or sprains usually do not create airway or breathing problems. Little else matters if the patient's airway or breathing is inadequate. And circulation. So focus on determining whether the patient has a pulse, has adequate perfusion, or is bleeding. Hypo perfusion or bleeding problems are most likely uh, should be your primary concern. So if skin is pale, cool, or clammy, and cap refill is slow, treat your patient for shock immediately. Maintain normal body temperatures. And if skeletal, musculoskeletal injuries in the extremities are suspected, they should be at least initially stabilized, if not splinted, prior to moving. And then the transport decision. So if the patient you're treating has an airway or breathing problem or significant bleeding, of course, provide rapid transport to the hospital for treatment. A patient who has a significant MOI, but whose condition appears otherwise stable should, be, should also be treat, transported promptly. When the decision for rapid transport is made, you can use a backboard as a splinting device to splint the whole body rather than splinting each extremity individually. Individual splints should be applied en route if the ABCs are stable and time permit. Patients with a simple MOI may be further assessed and their condition stabilized on scene prior to transport if no other problems exist. Fractures can break through the skin and cause external bleeding. Careful handling of the extremity minimizes the risk. If external bleeding is present, bandage the extremity quickly to control the bleeding. The bandage should be secure enough to control the bleeding without restricting circulation of the distal, uh, distal to the injury. Monitor bandage tightness by assessing the circulation and movement distal to the bandage. If bleeding cannot be controlled, quickly apply a tourniquet. History taking, of course, you're gonna ask for medical history and be alert for injuries, specific signs and symptoms, obtain a sample, Ask how and in what detail you explore the history depends on the seriousness of the patient's condition. Make an attempt to obtain the history without delaying definitive care. OPQRS can be limited in this in use in case of severe injuries and in, is usually too lengthy when matters of the airway, breathing, and circulation and rapid transport require immediate attention. As always, with your secondary assessment, if significant trauma is likely affected multiple systems, start with the secondary assessment of the entire body. Begin with the head and work uh, systematically towards the feet, checking the head, chest, abdomen, extremities, and back. The goal is to identify hidden and potentially life-threatening injuries. Use the DCAP BTLS approach to assess the muscular skeletal system. When lacerations are present in an extremity, 
an open fracture must be considered, bleeding controlled, and dresses applied. If your assessment finds no external signs of injury, ask the patient to move each limb carefully, stopping immediately if the movement causes pain. Skip this step if the patient reports neck and back pain. When non-significant trauma has occurred and you suspect that your patient has simple sprain, strain, dislocation, or fracture, you can take the time to focus your secondary assessment on that particular injury, looking for DCAP BTLS. You're evaluating the circulation, motor function, and abnormal sensations distal to the injury. Be sure to assess the entire zone of the injury. Any injury or deformity of the bone may be associated with vessel or nerve injury. You must assess neurological function every 5 to 10 minutes during the assessment depending on the patient's condition until he or she is at the hospital. Always recheck the neurological function before and after you split or otherwise manipulate the limb. Vital signs determine a baseline set of vital signs, including a pulse rate, rhythm, quality, respiratory rate, rhythm, and quality, blood pressure, skin condition, and pupil size, and reaction to light. Trending these vital signs helps you to understand whether the patient's condition is improving or getting worse over time. And the next uh, slide we're going to talk about is the reassessment. So repeat the primary assessment to ensure the interventions are working as they should. A reassessment should be performed five minutes for unstable and 15 for stable. Interventions, because of trauma patients often have multiple injuries, you must assess an overall condition, stabilize ABCs, and control any serious bleeding. It is in the critically injured patient, you should secure the patient to long backboard to mobilize the spine, pelvis, and extremities, and provide prompt transport to the trauma center. Um, in this situation, a secondary assessment is a waste of valuable time. Reassessment, reassessing the patient en route to the emergency department. If the patient has no life-threatening injuries, you may take extra time on scene to stabilize the patient's overall condition. Remove the patient's clothing and look for those open fractures or dislocations, severe deformity, swelling, or ecchymosis. When you have finished assessing the extremity, Apply a secure splint, commercial or otherwise, to stabilize the injury prior to transport. A comfortable and secure splint will reduce pain, reduce shock, and minimize compromised circulation. Check the patient's circulation, motor function, and sensation prior to and after splinting. The main goal is providing care in muscular skeletal injuries is stabilization in the most comfortable position that allows for maintenance of good circulation distal to the injury. Communication and documentation include a description of the problem found during your assessment. Report problems of the patient's ABCs, open fractures, and compromised circulation to, that occurred before and after splinting. Document complete descriptions of injuries and the mechanism of injuries associated with them. Your careful documentation may protect you from legal action and that patients may take later. Emergency medical care. Okay, so we're going to start to talk about treatment. So perform your primary assessment, stabilize your ABCs. If needed, perform secondary assessment of either the entire body or specific area and always follow the standard precautions. Be alert for signs and symptoms of internal bleeding. Follow the steps in skill drill 31-1 for caring for patients with a musculoskeletal injury. Okay, so splinting. A splint is a flexible or rigid device that is used to protect and maintain the position of an injured extremity. Unless the patient's life is in immediate danger, you should splint all fractures, dislocations, and sprains before moving the patient. Splinting reduces pain and makes it easier to transfer and transport the patient. In addition, splinting will help to prevent the following further damage to muscles, the spinal cord, peripheral nerves, 
and blood vessels from broken bone ends, lacerations of the skin by broken bone ends. One of the primary indications for splinting is to prevent a closed fracture from becoming an open fracture. Restriction of distal blood flow resulting from pressure of the bone ends on blood vessels. Splinting will help prevent excessive bleeding of the tissues at the injury, injury site caused by broken bone ends. Uh, increased pain from movement of the blown ends, paralysis of extremities resulting from a damaged spine. A splint is simply a device to prevent movement of an injured part. It can be made from any material any occasion, on occasion when you need to improvise. The three types of splints are rigid, formable, and traction splints. General principles of splinting. Okay, so general principles of splinting are remove clothing from the area of any suspected fracture or dislocation so that you can inspect the extremity for DCAP BTLS. Note and record the patient's neurovascular status distal to the site of the injury, including pulse sensation and movement. Cover open wounds with a dry sterile dressing prior to splinting. Do not move the patient before splinting in the extremity unless there is an immediate danger to the patient or you. In a suspected fracture of the shaft of any bone, be sure to stabilize the joints above and below the fracture. With injuries in and around a joint, be sure to stabilize the bones below and above the injured joint. Pat all rigid splints to prevent local pressure and discomfort to the patient. While applying the splint, maintain manual stabilization to prevent movement of the limb and support the injured site. If the fracture of the long bone shaft has shifted, has resulted in severe deformity, use constant gentle manual traction to align the limb so that it can be splinted. If you encounter resistant, to the limb alignment, splint the limb in its deformed position. Immobilize all suspected spinal injuries in a neutral inline position on the backboard. If the patient has signs, in, signs of shock, align the limb in the normal anatomic position and provide transport. When in doubt, split. Next, we're going to talk about the types of splints. So a rigid splint is non-formable and um, they are made from form material and are applied to sides, front, and or back of an injured extremity to prevent motion at the injury site. It takes two EMTs to apply a rigid splint. Follow the steps in Skill Drill Chapter 31, Skill Drill 31-2. There are two situations in which you must splint the limb in the position of deformity, when the deformity is severe and when you encounter resistance or extremity, extreme pain when applying gentle traction to the fracture of a shaft of a bone. And most dislocations should be splinted as found, but follow local protocols. Okay, next we're gonna talk about formable splints. And this is the second type of split. So formable splints is the most commonly used uh, form or soft splint is a pre-contoured inflatable or clear plastic or air splint. Always inflate the splint prior to applying it. The air splint is comfortable. It provides uniform contact and has the added advantage of applying firm pressure to a bleeding wound. Air splints are used to stabilize injuries below the elbow or below the knee. Air splints have some drawbacks, so particularly in cold weather areas, the zipper can stick, clog with dirt and freeze, and significant changes in weather or altitude can affect pressure of the air in the splint. So you must first cover all wounds with dry sterile dressing, making sure that uh, you um, use standard precautions.
and uh, for splint with a zipper, follow steps in the skill drill 31-3. If you use an unzippered or partially zippered type air splint, follow skill drill 31-4. Other formal splints include vacuum splints, pillow splints, structural sp aluminum splints, a sling and swath, and pelvic binders for pelvic fractures. So follow these steps in skill drills 31-5. Okay, the next type of splint we're going to talk about is called a traction splint. And so traction splints um, is the application of an inline traction. It's an act of pulling on the body structure in the direction of its normal alignment. And so it is the most effective way to realign a fracture of the shaft of the long bone so that the limb can be splinted more effectively. Traction splints are used primarily to secure fractures of the shaft of the femur, which are ca uh, characterized by pain, swelling, and deformity of the mid-thigh. When applied correctly, traction stabilizes the bone fragments and improves the overall alignment of the limb. Do not attempt to force the bone fragments back into alignment. In the field, the goals of inline traction are as followed. To stabilize the fractured fragments to prevent excessive movement, to align the limb sufficiently to allow it to be placed in a splint, and to avoid potential neurovascular compromise. Do not use a traction splint for any of the following conditions. So injuries of the upper extremities, injuries close to or involving knee, injuries of the pelvis, amputations or avulsions, or lower leg, foot, or ankle. So traction splints are only for mid-shaft femur fractures. And um, so in the photo, you could see uh, the, the mid-shaft area of that femur. And so we're going to talk about application of this. So proper application requires two EMTs. Before you apply the traction splint, you have to be sure to control any external bleeding. The amount of traction that is required varies, but often does not exceed 15 pounds. So you should use the least amount of force necessary. What you need to do is you grasp the foot um, at the end of the injured limb firmly. Once you start pulling, you should not stop until the limb is fully splinted. Imagine where the uninjured limb would lie and pull gently along the line of the imaginary limb until the injured limb is approximately in that position. If the patient strongly resists attraction or it causes more pain, stop and splint the limb in the deformed position. To apply the hair splint, follow skill drill 31-6. The Sager splint is a lightweight um, type of traction splint and um, uh, it's another type and you could follow the skill drill on 31-7. Okay, another type of uh, splint is the pelvic binder and that's when you have a pelvic fracture um, and it's used to splint the bony pelvis to reduce a hemorrhage from bone ends and that venous disruption and pain, pelvic binders are meant to provide temporary stabilization until definitive stabilization can be achieved. Generally, pelvic binders should be light, made of soft material and easily applied by one person. And they should allow access to the abdomen, uh, perineum, anus, and groin for examination. Okay, so there's, there are hazards of improper splinting. And of course, so compression of nerves, tissues, and blood vessels. There's a delay in transportation, um, reduction of distal circulation, aggravation of the injuries, and injury of tissues, nerves, blood vessels, or muscles as a result of excessive movement of the bones or joints. So very few, if any, musculoskeletal injuries justify the use of excessive speed during transport. So your transportation decision um, when it comes to orthopedic injuries um, 
so the limb will be stable once a dressing and splint has been applied. So a patient with a pulseless limb must be given, though, higher priority. So if the treatment facility is an hour or more away, a patient with a pulseless limb should be transported by helicopter or immediate ground transport. Specific musculoskeletal injuries is what we're going to um, break it down uh, into next. And so first we're going to talk about the cl clavicle and the scapula. So th remember that the clavicle the, or the collarbone, that's one of the most commonly fractured bones. And remember, because we were saying it, it's, it's so um, thin. And the fractures of the clavicle commonly occur in children when they fall and they put their hand out. So a patient with a fracture of the clavicle will report pain in the, that shoulder and usually um, hold their arm across the front of their body. So generally, um, swelling and point tenderness will occur over that clavicle. Because the clavicle is um, subcutaneous, the skin will occasionally tent under that uh, fracture. Uh, fractures of the scapula or shoulder blade occur much less frequently because this bone is well protected and many uh, is by many large muscles. So fractures of the scapula are almost always a result of a forceful direct back blow directly over the scapula. So provide supplemental oxygen and prompt transport. Um, it is associated with chest injuries usually, not the fracture scapula itself, that poses the greatest uh, threat of long-term disability. Abrasions, contusions, and significant swelling may occur, and the patient will often limit use of that arm because of the pain to that fractured site. And so joint, the joint between the outer end of the clavicle and this process of the scapula is called the acro, acromenial clavicle joint. This joint is frequently separated during sports such as football or hockey when the player falls and lands uh, on the point on the shoulder. So driving the scapula away from the outer end of the clavicle. The dislocation is often called an AC separation. Um, the, these fractures can be splinted effectively with a sling and cloth. So a sling is any bandage or material that helps support the weight of an injured upper extremity, relieving the downward pull of gravity on the injured site. To fully stabilize the shoulder region, a, a swath is a bandage that um, passes completely around the chest. It must be used to bind the arm to the chest wall. Leave the patient's fingers exposed so that you can reassess the neurovascular function at uh, regular intervals. Okay, next we're going to talk about um, treating this dislocation of the shoulder. So the shoulder joint is where the head of the humerus meets the, um, the scapula. And this um, glenoid foss fossa joint with the humeral head to form that glenohumeral joint. Um, and in the shoulder dislocations, the humeral head is most commonly dislocates uh, anteriorly. So coming to the line in front of the scapula as a result of force abduction and external rotation of this arm. So shoulder dislocations are extremely painful. The patient will guard the shoulder and try to protect it, holding the dislocated arm in that fixed position against that chest wall. The shoulder joint is usually locked and some patients may report numbness in the hand. Um, stabilizing an the anterior shoulder dislocation is difficult because any attempt to bring that arm towards that chest will produce pain. So if, uh, if you must splint the joint in whatever position is most comfortable for the patient, if necessary, placing a pillow or rolled blanket or towel between the arm and the chest to fill up that space and stabilize the arm, and then apply sling to the forearm or wrist to support that arm. Secure the arm in the sling and pillow and chest with a, with a swath and uh, transport the patient in a seated or semi-seated position. Okay, so now we are going to talk about the fractures of the humerus. So fractures of the humerus occur either prox proximally in the mid shaft or distally to the elbow. 
and frax fractures of the proximal humerus resulting are from falls are commonly among older people. Fractures of the mid shaft occur more often in young patients, usually as a result of a violent injury. With uh, any um, any fracture, you must consider um, applying traction to realign the fracture. Um, so support the, the site of the fracture with one hand and with the other hand, grasp the two humeral um, um, areas just above the elbow. Pull gently in line um, with the normal access of the limb. Splint the arm with a sling and swath um, supplemented with a, a padded board splint on the lateral aspect of the arm. So for elbow injuries, fractures, and dislocations often occur um, around the elbow, and uh, the different types of injuries are difficult to distinguish without a radiographic examination. So they, are, they produce similar limb deformities and require the same emergency care. So fracture to the distal humerus, this type of fracture is known as um, uh, two different types of fractures, and they're common in children. And... Um, so fracture ligaments rotate significant, uh, just a little bit differently, producing deformity and causing injuries to vessels and nerves. And swelling occurs rapidly and is severe usually. Then there's dislocations of the elbow. This type of injury occurs in athletes and rarely in young children. And the ulna and radius are most often displaced posteriorly relative uh, to the humerus. The posterior displacement makes the process of the ulna much more pro, um, prominent. And with this fracture, the distal humerus, there is swelling and um, significant uh, potential for vessel and nerve injury. And then there's elbow joint sprains. Um, this diagnosis is often mistakenly applied to um, non-displaced fractures. So fractures of the process of the ulna um, this fracture can result from direct or indirect forces and is often associated with lacerations and abrasions. The patient will be unable to actively extend the elbow. And then fractures of the radial head, so often misdiagnosed. This fracture generally occurs as a result of a fall onto an outstretched arm and a direct blow to the lateral aspect of the elbow. Attempts to rotate the elbow or wrist can cause di uh, discomfort and care of these elbow injuries. So elbow injuries are potential, potentially serious and require careful management. Always assess distal neurovascular functions periodi periodically in patients with elbow injuries. If you find strong pulses and good cap refill, splint that elbow injury in the position you found it, um, adding a wristling if it seems helpful. A cool, pale hand or a weak absent pulse and core, cool core cap refill indicate that the blood vessels have likely been injured. So further care of this patient must dictate, uh, be dictated by a physician. Notify medical control immediately. If the limb is pulseless and significantly deformed at the elbow, apply gentle manual traction in line with the long axis of the limb to decrease the deformity provide prompt transport for all patients with impaired distal circulation. And then fractures of the forearm. So fractures of the forearm, um, fractures of the shaft of the radius and ulna are common in all people of all age groups and are most common though in children and older um, people. Usually both bones break at the same time. An isolated fracture of the shaft of the ulna may occur as a result of direct blow. That's a night stick fracture. Um, uh, the term silver fork fracture is usually to describe the distinctive appearance of a patient's arm, um, especially in elderly patients with osteoporosis, and are often known as Coles fractures. Um, that's a distal radius fracture. Um, to stabilize fractures of the forearm and wrist, use a padded board air, vacuum, or pillow splint. And injuries of the wrist and hand, 
range from dislocation to sprains must be confirmed by radiograph uh, examination. Dislocations are, are usually associated with a fracture resulting in a fracture dislocation. Another common wrist injury is an isolated, non-displaced fracture of the carpal bone, especially um, in the scap scaphoid. Any questionable wrist sprain or fracture should be splinted and evaluated in the emergency department. Okay, next we're going to talk about fractures of the pelvis. So fracture of the pelvis often results from direct compression in the form of a heavy blow that laterally uh, crushes the pelvis. So the blow may be from a motor vehicle crash, a weapon, a falling object, or a fall from a height. Injuries to the pelvis can result can also be caused from indirect forces. So however, not all pelvic fractures result from violent trauma. Fractures of the pelvis can be accompanied by life-threatening blood loss from the laceration of the vessels um, affixed to the pelvis at certain key points. So up to several liters of blood may drain from the pelvic space and in the retroperitoneal space, which lies between the abdominal cavity and the posterior abdominal wall. The result is significant hypotension, shock, and um, sometimes death. So you must take immediate steps to treat shock if there is um, only minimum swelling to the area. Because the pelvis is surrounded by heavy muscle, open fractures of the pelvis are uncommon. You should suspect a fracture of the pelvis in any patient who has sustained high velocity injury and complaints of discomfort to that lower back or ab abdomen. Deformity or swelling may be very difficult to see. The most reliable sign of a fractured pelvis is stable, ten simple tenderness or instability on firm compression and palpation. Assess for tenderness by taking the following steps. Place the palms of your hand over the lateral aspect of each iliac crest and apply firm but gentle inward pressure on the pelvic ring. With the patient lying supine, place a palm over the anterior aspect of the iliatic crest and apply downward firm pressure. Use the palm of your hand to firmly but gently palpate the pubic symphysis. And this figure shows, and on this slide shows how to um, to assess the pelvic region for tenderness and instability. And then there's dislocation of the hip. So the hip is very stable. It's a ball and socket joint, but it dislocates only after significant injury. So most dislocations of the hip are posterior, most commonly occurring as a result of a motor vehicle crash in which the knee meets with a direct force um, of the entire femur is driven posteriorly. And you should suspect a hip dislocation in a patient who has been in an automobile crash and has a contusion, laceration, or obvious fracture in the knee region. So posterior dislocations of the hip is frequently complicated by an injury of the sciatic nerve, which is located directly behind that hip joint. So the sciatic nerve is the largest nerve in the lower extremity. It controls the, inactive, it controls the activity of the muscle in that thigh and below the knee and the sensation of most of the leg and foot. When the head of the femur is forced out of the socket, it, uh, it may compress and stretch that sciatic nerve, leading to partial or incomplete paralysis of the nerve. And uh, so dislocation of the hip is associated with very distinct signs. The patient will have severe pain in the hip with a strong resistance, uh, strongly resists any attempt to move the hip. The lateral and posterior aspect of the hip region will be tender on palpation. Occasionally, sciatic nerve function will be normal uh, at first and then slowly diminish. As with any other extremity, do not attempt to reduce the dislocated hip in the field unless medical control directs you to do so. Um, splint the dislocation in the position of the deformity. Place the patient supine on a long backboard. Support the effective limb with a pillow and rolled blankets. Secure the entire limb to the backboard with long straps and provide prompt transport. And then fractures of that proximal femur. Fractures of the proximal femur are common fractures, especially in older people. 
in patients with osteoporosis. So the break goes through the neck of the femur and uh, across the proximal shaft of the femur. And they'll display uh, characteristics of uh, deformity. And they lie with the leg externally rotated. So the injured limb is usually shorter than the opposite uninjured limb. Patients will lie, typically are unable to move or walk. And the hip region is usually tender on palpation. And gentle rolling of the leg will cause pain. So assess the pelvis for any soft tissue injury and bandage. Assess pulses, motor, and sensation, looking for signs of vascular and nerve damage. Splint the lower extremity and transport to the emergency department. All patients with a hip fracture may lose significant amounts of blood. So B, uh, you should treat with high flow O2 and be alert for signs of shock. And then we talked about the femur, those shaft fractures, and those are the ones that we're going to um, to use the um, uh, traction split on, right? So following the following a fracture, large muscles of that thigh um, will spasm in an attempt to splint this unstable limb, and so it's going to cause a lot of pain. And usually, the limb will also shorten significantly. So fractures may also be open. Um, but uh, never attempt to push that bone back into the skin. And there's often a significant amount of blood loss, as much as five to 1,000 liters um, after a fracture. So it is not unusual for hypovolemic shock to develop. And because of the severe deformity that occurs with these fractures, bone fragments may penetrate or press on important nerves and vessels that uh, and produce significant damage. So you must carefully and periodically assess the distal neurovascular function in these patients and cover any wound with dry, sterile dressing, of course. A fracture of the femoral shaft is best stabilized with a traction splint, such as a Sager splint. Injuries of the knee ligament. So the knee is a very vulnerable uh, to injure. Therefore, many types of injuries occur in this uh, region. Uh, ligament injuries range from mild sprains to complete dislocations of the knee. So the patella, it, uh, it can also dislocate. And any bony elements of the knee can fracture. And the knee is especially susceptible to ligament injuries which occur when abnormal bending and twisting forces are applied. So when you examine the patient, you will generally find swelling, occasional ecchymosis, so point tenderness and joint effusion. You should splint all suspected uh, knee ligament injuries. The splint should extend from the hip joint to the foot and stabilize the bone above the injured joint and the bone below it. The variety of splints uh, can be used included a padded, rigid leg, long leg splint, or two padded board splints. And then you have the dislocation of the knee. So dislocations of the knee are true emergencies that may threaten the limb. So when the knee is dislocated, the ligaments that provided support uh, to it may be damaged or torn. The proximal end of the tibia completely displaces from its juncture with the lower end of the femur, usually producing a significant deformity. Always check the distal circulation carefully before taking any other step. The direction of the displacement refers to the position of the tibia with respect to the femur. So the posterior knee dislocations are the most common, occurring in most almost half of the cases, half of the cases. Commonly, the anterior and posterior ligaments are damaged but they are, there is also a high risk of injury to the popliteal artery. Medial dislocations result in a direct blow to the lateral part of the leg. Patients who commonly complain of pain to the knee will report that the knee gave out. Um, complications may include limb-threatening popliteal artery disruption. So that is when that popliteal artery is, is ruptured. Uh, injuries to the nerves, joint instability. If distal um, pulses are present, splint the injury, splint the knee in the position in which you found it and transport the patient promptly.
and fractures about the knee. So fractures about the knee may occur to the distal end of the femur at the proximal end of the tibia or in the patella. So it is easy to confuse a non-displaced or minimally displaced fracture with a knee or ligament injury. Management of two types of injuries is the following. So if there if there is an adequate distal pulse and no significant deformity, splint the limb with the knee straight. If there is adequate pulse and significant deformity, splint the joint in the position of the deformity. So if the pulse is absent below the level of the knee, suspect vascular, possible vascular nerve damage and contact medical control. Never use a traction splint if you suspect a fractured knee. Next, we're going to talk about the dislocation of the patella. So the patella most commonly occurs in teenagers and young adults who are engaged in athletic activities. And usually the dislocation of the patella uh, displaces to that lateral side. So the displacement produces a significant deformity in which the knee is held in a moderately fixed position and the patella is displaced to that lateral side of the knee. Splint the knee in the position in which you found it. <clears throat> Most often it this is with the knee flexed uh, at a moderate degree. So apply padded board splints to the medial and lateral aspect of the joint extending from the hip to the ankle. The ankle is commonly um, injured joint. Ankle injuries occur in people of all age, ages and range in severity from simple sprain to severe fracture dislocations. Any, any ankle injury produces pain, swelling, and localized tenderness. And most frequent mechanism of ankle injury is a twisting which stretches or tears the supporting ligament. You can manage the wide spectrum of ankle injuries the following way. So dress the wounds, assess distal neurovascular function, correct any gross deformity by applying gentle longitudinal traction to the heel, and before reassessing a traction, all apply a splint. And then foot injuries. Injuries to the foot can result in the dislocation or fracture of one of the more of the tarsals, metatarsals, or phalanges of the toes. So toe fractures are easily common. Of the tarsals or callus, the heel bone is the most frequently fractured. So injury often occurs when a patient falls or jumps from the height and, and lands directly on the heel. Frequently, the force of the injury is transmitted up the legs to the spine, producing a fracture of the lumbar spine. If you suspect that the foot is dislocated, immediately assess for pulses and motor and sensory functions. If pulses are present, immobilize the extremity using a commercially available splint. If pulses are absent, contact medical control. Injuries of the foot are associated with significant swelling but rarely gross deformity. To, to splint the foot, apply a rigid padded board splint an air splint or a pillow splint, stabilizing the ankle, joint, and foot. Okay, next we're going to talk about strains and sprains. Treat every severe sprain as if it is a fracture. In general, treatment is similar to the fractures, and we're going to use an acronym uh, we call RICES. And so the R stands for rest, I is ice, C is compression, E um, elevation in uh, S or is splinting and um, okay so amputations control bleeding and treat for shock surgeons today can occasionally reattach amputated parts with partial amputations be sure to immobilize the body part with bulky compression dressing and splint to prevent further injury do not um, uh, sever any partial amputations. Control any bleeding from the stump. If bleeding is severe, quickly apply a tourniquet. With a complete amputation, make sure you wrap the clean part in a sterile dressing and place it in a plastic bag. Follow local protocols regarding how to preserve amputated parts. 
Put the bag in a cool container filled with ice. The goal is to keep the part cool without allowing it to freeze or develop frostbite. The amputated part should be transported to the, with the patient to the appropriate resource hospital. Next, we're going to talk about compartment syndrome. And so compartment syndrome most often occurs with a fractured tibia or forearm of children. And so often overlooked, especially in patients with an altered mental, um, altered level of consciousness, compartment syndrome typically develops within 6 to 12 hours after an injury and usually as a result of excessive bleeding, a, a severe, severely crushed injury, or uh, the rapid return of blood to an ischemic limb. And so this syndrome is characterized by pain that is out of uh, proportion to that injury. So pain on passive stretching of muscle within that compartment. And usually it's a, there's could be a decreased sensation or pallor or decreased um, power to that area. If you have a pediatric patient with a fracture below the elbow or the knee, be on the lookout for the signs and symptoms of extreme pain or decreased pain in sensation, or pain on stretching of affected muscles, or decreased power. Uh, these are indicators that the pressure within that uh, area is uh, has been um, um, elevated. And if you suspect that the patient has compartment syndrome, splint that limb, keep it at the level of the heart, and provide immediate transport. Reassess that neurovascular status frequently during transport. Okay, and so compartment syndrome was the last uh, slide that we we're going to discuss in Chapter 31, Orthopedic Injuries, and um, next up is the review questions. Thank you for uh, um, being here and, and reviewing this. Uh, I'm going to let you review the questions on your own. Thank you.